All right, we are back again, ladies and gentlemen, with another answer to a question that I got on the Q&A. This question, and I'm gonna butcher it because I don't have the question in front of me, but it was regarding training frequency. It was basically saying, listen, I've seen a lot of people training a muscle group five, six, seven times a week. Um, is there any actual benefit to that? Is that an evidence-based decision that they're making? Are they going to get additional hypertrophy from that or not? So what does the research say? What's the practical application? And we're gonna get into both on this PowerPoint right here. All right, so the first thing that I wanted to do was look at research. In my research, I wanted things that were relatively recent, so I kept it from the year 2010 or later. Um, I got about five studies here. There were a lot more. Some of them I didn't like very much because they had poor methods. They were on untrained individuals. Or they were just on, just poor, not, not well put together, or they were on a population that didn't pertain to us. We do have one group that was untrained in here. So full disclaimer, one of these studies, the subjects were untrained. So the five studies that I chose, I wanted to start off with the most recent one that I've seen from Brad, from Dr. Schoenfeld, that looked at the totality of the research. And that one was the effects of resistance training frequency on measures of muscle hypertrophy. So that's a systematic review, that's a meta-analysis. And we'll get into what was the inclusion criteria, how many studies to be analyzed, how many total subjects, etc. The second one was from Schoenfeld and Contreras. Those are kind of the two big names that if you're on Instagram, you know those two names, um, as well as Radimus Peterson and if Tiriaki Sanmez is listening to this, I'm sorry, I apologize. He will destroy my name too, so we can commiserate on that. That one was called Influence of Resistance Training Frequency on Muscular Adaptations in Well-Trained Men. So an interesting one there, well-trained men were the subjects. The third study that I used was effects of eight weeks, equal volume resistance training with different workout frequency on maximal strength, endurance, and body comp. So that was the one that was done on untrained individuals, which is why you see um, some different variables going on in there. Fourth one, high frequency resistance training is not more effective than low frequency resistance training in increasing muscle mass and strength in well-trained men, published in 2019 from Gomez, Franco, Nunez, and Orsati. And the final one was a recreation or an attempted recreation uh, out of Bill Campbell's lab of the quote unquote Norwegian Frequency Project. So the Norwegian Frequency Project, if you're not familiar, was a pool of data that never actually got published. If it did get published, someone please send it to me because I haven't seen it. But it was a pool of data on the Norwegian powerlifting team. I do believe I'm not uh, quoting that incorrectly. The Norwegian powerlifting team, they split them up. This group over here did three times a week frequency. This group over here did six times a week frequency. And we looked at what were the strength and the hypertrophy adaptations and what was the difference between the two. Now, from what I've heard on what the data said, it showed that the six times a week group not only got stronger, but they also got bigger. Can't confirm that until I've actually seen the data, so we'll hold off on that. But this last study, the fifth one on here, was supposed to be a recreation of that, a three times a week group and a six times a week group, and which, uh, what kind of adaptations did we see? So this is, or these are five of what I think are the best in terms of comparing frequency. So let's kind of get into these, let's not waste any time. Now, the first one is our meta-analysis. Our systematic review came from Schoenfeld and Krieger, as well as Ogborn. The inclusion criteria on this one was, we used 10 total studies. So the inclusion criteria was, it had to be in English, so an English language journal, it had to be traditional dynamic resistance exercise, meaning that we were emphasizing both concentric and eccentric, no strictly isometrics, no strictly concentrics, no strictic, strictly eccentric studies. Um, the changes in muscle mass, so the changes in how much lean body mass they actually gain, had to be measured via biopsy. So we actually had to biopsy the muscle. Imaging, so ultrasound. Circumference measures, or some form of densitometry, so some sort of body fat analysis. Um, the study had to be four weeks minimum in duration. Four weeks is still a little bit short, but if we do want to see any appreciable hypertrophy at all whatsoever, the four week point, bare minimum, I would like to see eight, but we're trying to find some studies here. So four week was the minimum. The individuals had to be healthy, they had to be disease free, and they had to be human. So no, no animal research. 
Now, what did the meta-analysis show? It showed that there was a greater effect size in higher frequency training protocols, meaning that the higher frequency training protocols showed a greater effect, the amount of hypertrophy, um, than the lower frequency training protocols. The authors concluded that when you compare studies that investigate training muscle groups between one to three days per week, so we don't see anything in terms of three plus included in this study. So one to three days per week on a volume equated basis, current body of evidence indicates that frequencies of training twice a week promote superior hypertrophic outcomes to once a week. Whether training three times per week is superior to twice a week remains to be concluded. So what they concluded here is that training two times a week is for sure, without a doubt, better than one time a week. So training your biceps, your quads, whatever muscle group you end up choosing, training that muscle group twice a week will definitely, definitely be better than training it once a week. However, when we ask the question of, well, is three times a week better than two times a week? Is four times a week better than two times a week? Is six times a week better than three times a week? Now we don't know. Now we're not so sure. The research is not conclusive in that adding additional sessions over training a muscle group twice a week will give you additional hypertrophic benefits. So very, very interesting stuff there. What can we conclude for sure from this is that two definitely beats one. Does three beat two? Not so sure. Now, up next, we've got our influence of resistance training frequency on muscular adaptations in well-trained men. So this is the Schoenfeld and Contreras study that we were talking about. Um, the sample size, so we had 20 individuals complete the study, 20 well-trained, healthy men. They defined well-trained as training three times a week for a minimum of a year. So a year straight of three times a week training. The age of the subjects, around 23 and a half years old, plus or minus 2.9 years. So they were in that kind of 20 to 26, 27 range. Now the training protocols, both of which were eight weeks long. So we've kind of exceeded the four week minimum that we said was kind of wishy-washy before. We're at the eight week point now. So this is a better time for, I like this time frame a little bit better than I like four weeks. 12 weeks would be even better. 16 weeks would be even better, but good luck recruiting a subject and getting them to stay for 16 weeks all the way through a training protocol. So we've got eight weeks here, two groups, one they called the split group. So that's your traditional body part split where you split the body parts up into specific days. And then the other was total body. So total body three times a week. Uh, nutrition. So nu nutrition is a very important one. We look at hypertrophy uh, studies because we wanna see what were they actually eating. If one group is eating significantly more protein than the other and they get more hypertrophy than the other, what's to say that the additional hypertrophy gain from the group that was eating more protein wasn't just from the protein intake. So what do we wanna do with nutrition is we just wanna control it. We wanna say wherever you are at, stay at that. Don't try and change up your eating habits at all. So the subjects were instructed to maintain their current dietary habits. Don't change a thing. And they also self-reported in MyFitnessPal. Are there issues with self-reporting? Of course there are, but this is the best that we got. Um, subjects were also supplied with a supplement, 24 grams of whey protein, one hour post-exercise on training days. So those were that was both sides. So both sides were getting that 24 grams of protein after training. Now, what were we measuring? We were measuring muscle thickness via ultrasound and muscular strength was being taken via a 1RM parallel back squat and the bench press. So we were doing strength assessments as well as hypertrophy assessments. I've also included the training protocol on screen here. See the split group versus the total body group. The split group has a day of bench press, incline, chest press. So like a chest and back day, followed by a leg day, followed by a shoulders and arms day. Whereas the total body group trained every muscle every day. So they did a full body program every day. Now, what were the results? So what were we actually looking at here? We're gonna see some charts on the next couple slides. They're gonna actually look at the results. So the results that we were measuring, we wanted to look at weekly volume load between the groups. So which group was able to accrue more volume? We know that volume definitely plays a role in muscular hypertrophy. Um, 
and we could say that, well, the group that did more volume probably grew more, so we're gonna see who did more volume. And then we're gonna get into our ultrasound measurements of muscle thickness. So forearm flexor thickness, forearm extensor thickness, so your elbow flexors and your elbow extensors, your biceps and your triceps, vastus lateralis, so muscle of the quadricep, and then we're also gonna do our 1RM testing, our 1RM of the squat and the bench press. Before we look at the charts, I wanted to give you the author's conclusion from their mouth. They said, this study suggests the existence of a dose-response relationship between resistance training frequency and muscular adaptations. It is conceivable that optimal hypertrophic benefits could be obtained by periodizing frequency over the course of a long-term training cycle. So that's very interesting. This is one of the few pieces of literature that I saw in the conclusion where the authors recommend a periodization to your frequency. Maybe something like a specialization cycle where you've got a bodybuilder who needs to bring up their arms. So they train arms three times a week for a few months out of the year and then they dial it down. So they're actually periodizing their training frequencies. So a very, very interesting and I think prudent recommendation from the authors here in actually periodizing how frequently you train a muscle group. But again, if we think back to our last study, the meta-analysis from uh, Schoenfeld, what did that tell us? It told us that three times a week, or actually told us that two times a week is better than one time a week. And then two and three were about the same. So it would make sense that in this study where you have one group doing three times a week, one group doing one time a week, based on what the meta-analysis said, what would you expect to, to show us? Obviously the three times a week group is going to outperform in muscular hypertrophy adaptations, the one time a week group. Let's see if the charts actually show that. So we look at weekly volume load here. The author, authors noted no significant differences between the groups. You do see that the total body group was able to do more volume on all of the body parts, some higher standardized or some higher standard deviations there, but there was no significant difference between the groups. So it wasn't that the total body did this, this vastly larger amount of volume than the split group. However, I would make the argument that you probably can do more volume per muscle group if you split it up over a couple days because you get less intracession fatigue. So if I want to train my quads four times a week and I squat on Monday, leg press on Wednesday, leg extension on Thursday, and on Saturday I come back and I do front squat, each day, since I'm only doing one quad exercise, I'll be able to accrue more volume and more high quality work on those exercises, as opposed to if I just condense them all into one day, where I'm great on squat, a little bit fatigued on leg press, starting to feel it on leg extension, and I'm absolutely trashed by the time I get to front squat. So splitting it up may allow you to do more volume, but in this study, they did not find that to be the case. Up next, we've got elbow flexor thickness. Um, so that bicep thickness. Oh God, that's embarrassing. Um, so your elbow flexors, the, uh, <laughs> the biceps group. What did we find here? Significant differences favoring the high frequency group. So arms, just what they're saying with their data, it looks like if you want to grow your biceps, your elbow flexors, a higher frequency approach will beat out the lower frequency group. Good to know. Elbow extensor thickness. So now we're looking at our triceps. No significant difference between high frequency and low frequency groups. Just looking at these charts here, the black being the pre-measurement, the uh, dashed being the post-measurement. So you can see that both groups grew their elbow extensors, but no significant difference between the groups. How about vastus lateralis, the quads? No significant difference between the high frequency and the low frequency group. So no significant difference on hypertrophy there. What you can see is in the pre and post, you can see that it looks like the total body group outperformed the split routine group a little bit larger of an increase there, but it wasn't, it didn't reach statistically significant difference. So take what you will from that. Um, no difference between the two groups. How about strength? 
What if I want to get strong? Do I want to train frequently or not as frequently? No significant differences between the groups for the parallel back squat or the bench press 1RM. So no significant difference in either. You can see that in both groups, bench press on the right and our squat on the left. What you notice there is that both groups got stronger, but again, no significant difference between the groups. So moving on to our third study here, our third study, um, I put it in caps so that you guys would see it, notice it. The sample was 39 untrained healthy men here. So this is on untrained individuals. If you know exercise physiology, if you know exercise science, if you know strength conditioning, you know that untrained individuals will grow from anything. They can sit in the corner of the gym and basket weave and they'll get bigger and stronger. So take this study with that tiny grain of Himalayan pink salt because you've got to be healthy. Um, the requirement to be classified as untrained in this study was that they had never been involved in any type of resistance training. The average age of subjects was around 20 years old. The training protocol was eight weeks in duration. So a good duration here. And they split into four groups. So P1 was 12 exercises. They did it one time a week. So they came in on Saturday. They did all 12 of their exercises. P2, group two, they did 12 exercises, split over two times a week. So Saturday and Tuesday. They would come in on Saturday, they do six exercises, and come in on Tuesday and do six exercises. P3 or group three, 12 exercises three times a week. You guessed it. They would come in and they would split those 12 exercises over three days. So they would do four on Saturday, four on Monday, four on Friday. The fourth group was a control. They did nothing. Measurements that we were taking were body weight, body composition. They did a three site skin fold. Um, they did a thigh and an upper arm circumference, as well as an 8RM leg press and bench press test. Those were their strength tests. Local muscular endurance at 60% 1RM on leg press and bench press. So not only did they do the 8RM to find if they were gaining muscular strength in the area, submaximal muscular strength, they also did local muscular endurance where they would throw 60% of their calculated 1RM on the leg press and the bench press and just go until they reached volitional failure, meaning that ah, I can't do any more. They stopped. All right, so P1, group one, the full body group, they came in on Saturday and they did leg press, leg curl, leg extension, calf raise, lat pull down, lat pull row, bench press, pec fly, arm curl, dumbbell arm curl, triceps push down, and dumbbell tricep extension, all in one day. P2, the full body group, twice a week, split it up. So they would come in and do full body, but twice a week. So they kind of just mixed and matched the exercises. And then P3, group, group three, they did the kind of like a lower upper lower split where they did some lower body exercises on Saturday, come in on Monday, do upper body exercises, and Friday they would finish their lower body exercises for the week. So what are some interesting things about this study right here? I wanna look at the individual groups and how the exercises were actually split up. Put yourself in the shoes of an untrained individual, someone who's never lifted a weight in their entire life. Walk up in the gym and do three sets of eight to 12 on all of those exercises in one day, you are going to be trashed. By the time you get to the last couple exercises, the quality of work that you're going to be able to put in is going to be terrible. I would argue that even group two is gonna suffer from that. This full body session, relatively challenging for them. I think that if I was a beginner and I was writing, or I was writing out a program for a beginner, I would choose the P3 option, the split option. So even though we've stated before that high frequency is going to outperform lower frequency two times a week being superior to one time a week, what you have to consider is that doesn't apply for the untrained individual because the training stimulus will be so great that they won't be able to recover or get the most quality um, exercises, the most quality sets, most quality volume out of that session. So that's kind of just my two cents. Interesting to hear if you guys agree with that, disagree with that. Hit me in the comments below and I will, uh, I'll definitely respond if you have something uh, interesting and insightful to say. Don't just call me fat. So the results, aka a shit ton of charts, I'm hoping on your screen that you can see these. 
Uh, it's kind of small on my screen, so I'm kind of just hoping for the best. What I do want to read is the author's conclusion here. The authors concluded that a split routine system allows the training intensity for a particular body part or group of exercises to be higher than would be possible if the four to six sessions were combined into two to three sessions of equivalent training volume. So the authors kind of agreed with me here, and they're saying that by splitting it up, the quality of the session increases, they're able to get a better workout in, so splitting it up makes more sense. They concluded with, collectively, we recommend that novice individuals had better use a split routine training for improving performance and promoting muscular adaptations. So they say, if you want to promote muscular adaptations, split it up so you can make sure the session is quality. Now, my counterpoint to my previous counterpoint to their point that they're making right now, can you keep up with all that, is that higher frequency, so a full body training session that uses less exercises more times throughout the week might be the best of both worlds. So what I mean by that is choosing compound exercises where you're hitting multiple muscle groups with one exercise, choosing four or five exercises per session so that it's not too long or too strenuous of a session, and then repeating that three times a week or two times a week, whatever it is. So maybe you go with like an upper lower, upper lower. So that's a two times a week frequency. You choose five good upper body exercises, five good lower body exercises. Monday, you do the upper. Tuesday, you do the lower. Take Wednesday off. Thursday, you do the upper. Friday, you do the lower. That way you've got plenty of recovery, but you're still hitting each of the muscle groups twice a week. Would that be better for an untrained group? Not sure. Till we see it in the research, I can't conclude. But I have my two cents. I think that would be the best way to approach it. But if we look at these charts right here, all of them pretty much support what the authors were saying, where this P3 group, the split routine, where you had the lower, upper, lower, they got, for the most part, the best results across all the groups. So the big takeaway point on this one is for untrained individuals, these training sessions are gonna be really, really hard if you try and pack too many exercises into one. If you are gonna go that route, you'd be better off splitting it up. All right, our fourth study here, high frequency resistance training is not more effective than low frequency resistance training in increasing muscle mass and strength in well-trained men. So our previous three, our previous two, the meta-analysis and the study from Contreras and uh, Schoenfeld, show that the higher frequency group outperformed the lower frequency group. This study shows the opposite of that, or purports the opposite of that. So let's get into the kind of the methods here. The sample was 23 well-trained, healthy men. This is one of the studies, and you can find another one if you want and send it to me, please do where the individuals had the highest amount of training experience. We are looking at people with 6.9 plus or minus 3.1 years. So quite a bit of training experience for these individuals. Now, the, they were split into two groups. The sets and intensities were equated. So that's very important right there, is that the amount of sets that they did and the intensity those sets were at were the exact same. So whether you were training high frequency or low frequency, the set and intensity demand placed on the body was the same. So, so keep that in mind. Now the high frequency group did full body five times a week. So a good one here because they're doing five times a week. Here's where I was kind of disappointed. The low frequency was one time a week. I'm really, really looking forward to see when someone actually puts together a study that looks like looks at five times a week versus three times a week or six times a week versus two times a week. Really looking forward to seeing some research that compares those two. But for the sake of this study, we were looking at five times a week versus one time a week. Um, the training protocol itself, uh, we were doing 10 to 15 sets per body part per week. So about one to two exercises per, per body part or 10 to 15 sets total per week one to two exercises per body part, eight to 12 repetitions max. So we were training 70 to 80% of one RM, uh, looking at five sessions per week. The measurements that were taken were bench press and squat one RM, as well as lean body mass measured via DEXA. I know DEXA, wishy-washy, but don't pick apart studies like that. Don't be an evidence-based asshole. 
take what you get from the data. So they use DEXA. Results of the study, both groups improved their strength in both squat and bench press, as well as increasing lean body mass. No significant differences between the groups. Um, my, <laughs> my UCF ID doesn't log me into the library anymore, so I couldn't get full text on this one. I would have liked to see some of the charts to kind of see if there were some small differences between the two, but for the sake of what the authors are reporting, they are reporting that there was no significant difference between the group. So again, take take my analysis of the study with a bit of a caveat because I didn't have access to the full text. The author's note was that both training frequencies provide similar overload when sets and intensity are equated per week. That's an important little note that they add there at the end. They say that if you do the same amount of sets and at the same intensity, it doesn't matter how frequently you train. Now again, my counterpoint to that is that higher frequency training might allow you to do more sets at a higher intensity then what results are we going to see? Well, if the high frequency group lets you do more sets and maintain a higher intensity over the course of the week, then that group would outperform the low frequency group, obviously. Um, but that's not what they looked at here. So take it for what you will. Up next was the redo, or the reanalysis of the... Um, what am I looking at here? Norwegian Frequency Project. Couldn't remember the country. I was going to say Swedish. And then if anyone was watching from Sweden or Norway, they'd be offended. Um, so looking at this one, we had a sample of 28 college-aged men. They were 18 to 30. Training experience was a six-month minimum. However, because this was a powerlifting biased program or powerlifting biased study, um, there was some more inclusion criteria. They had to be involved at least three days a week in some form of powerlifting training, meaning that they need to be doing the squat, the bench, and the deadlift at least three days a week. They had to have a one and a quarter body weight back squat. They had to be able to bench their body weight and deadlift two times their body weight. There were two groups. Uh, the set Again, the sets and intensities were equated across the groups, so take note of that. High frequency was six times a week. Low frequency was three times a week. So this matches up with the Norwegian Frequency Project. Six week dur duration, so a little shorter than the others. Not the usual eight week, but we got six weeks here. Um, they called it an auto-regulated DUP approach. So they allowed the um, subjects to auto-regulate a bit of their training based on how they were feeling for the day. However, they were still able to equate volume between the groups. It was a highly powerlifting specific. However, the subjects were allowed to do some assistance work. So the authors noted that they let the subjects do some additional work for their arms, their delts, their, uh, their lats, some, some rear delt work, some extra quad and some hamstring work. Um, however, they didn't mention specifically what that accessory work was and what volume they were doing that accessory work at. So I, I, I just can't help but wonder if they were able to control for... Um, the amount of accessory work or equate the accessory work that the two groups were doing. The measurements that they took were body weight, body comp via skin fold and ultrasound, nice, um, and 1RM squat bench deadlift. The results that they found, no significant differences between the groups. I also include the training program above. Both groups made gains in strength and fat-free mass that were just statistically significant, but again, no differences between the two. So what do we find again is that when you equate for sets and intensities, what you're going to see is very, very um, similar results when it comes to strength and fat-free mass gains. The authors noted that, for example, there may be benefit in increasing training frequency from once a week to three times per week, but perhaps no additional effect from increased frequency from three times a week to six times per week. So that's kind of the big question here that was behind what the individual who asked the question was asking. They weren't saying, is training a muscle group three times a week better than one time a week? That's been pretty flushed out in the research that it is. They were saying, what if I take it up to six times a week or seven times a week? Is there an additional benefit? And from the look of the research right now, it's either no or we're not so sure. There needs to be more research. So that's one of the big caveats of this presentation as a whole is that the literature, as it always is, isn't complete on the subject. So if you can train at a higher frequency that allows you to maintain a higher intensity and a higher volume over the course of a week or weeks or months, then you would theorize that that, product or that program 
might give you better results when it comes to hypertrophy. So I had about 12 slides here. I condensed it into one because it was gonna be like 45 minutes of my take home points and uh, my beloved Jimbo, she told me to use the seven by seven rule. Seven words per line, seven lines on a slide, something like that. I butchered it, I killed it. Um, seven by seven rule, it's the one. All right, so my take home points here. Now, I said this kind of previously on the last slide. I said there's a dearth of data on the subject. So while there is good data on the subject that supports that increasing your frequency from one time a week to two times a week or maybe three times a week will offer you additional benefit, there is a very limited quantity of research looking at, well, what happens when I go from three times a week to four times a week or five times a week or six times a week? What happens then? We do have that, that uh, the, the last study that we looked at um, and that showed no difference between the group, but that was a very powerlifting focused program. Now, what if we took that and we adapted it to more of a bodybuilder style program? Then what kind of results would we see? We'll have to wait. Study design is very challenging here. So we kind of picked that apart in some of the studies as well, where we looked at, oh, hell yeah, three times a week for six times a week. Finally, we're going to figure it out. And then there's that little note that says volume and intensity equated between the groups. And you're like, shit. Well, there's not going to be a significant difference between the groups unless you allow the volume and intensity to kind of fall as it will and let the frequency manipulate or frequency, let the frequency dictate how much volume they're training with and how much intensity they're training with. Because if the frequency allows them to train with and recover from additional volume at adequate intensity, then that group should outperform the lower frequency group. But that's not what happened in the study. But designing a study is very, very challenging when this is the subject that we're looking at. So now we kind of get into the more of the practical of it. Like we've looked at the research, seen what that has to say. What are the actual practical takeaways here? So we have to break down, why would someone embark on a high frequency training program to begin with? Maybe they want to do less volume for a body part in a single session to allow them to get a higher quality of work. In my opinion, that's the biggest benefit of higher frequency training is that if I do 20 sets of biceps in a single session, after I've done 10 sets, my biceps are so trashed that the additional 10 sets that I'm going to do are going to be absolutely terrible. They're going to be worthless. They're going to be what Dr. Mike Isertel would call junk volume. So what's another way to approach that? Well, why don't I train biceps three times a week? I do seven sets per session. So now I'm doing 21 sets of biceps over the course of a week, and I'm not running into that issue of intra-session fatigue. All of my seven sets within that session are of high quality. They're at adequate intensity, getting a good mind-muscle connection, and I'm improving the quality of my work. So in that scenario, you can use high frequency to your advantage. Some other benefits of higher frequency training are kind of outside of the scope of a presentation on hypertrophy, but I'll mention them. So skill acquisition is a low intensity, high frequency dominated endeavor. When you're trying to learn a skill, you want to do it at a very low intensity and you want repeated frequent exposures. So if I'm trying to learn how to do a barbell snatch, I do not go to the gym once a week and max out my snatch. I go in five, six, seven times a week, and I do very, very light snatches at low speeds to learn the movement. But skill acquisition and hypertrophy are very, very different. So we'll leave the skill acquisition stuff for another day. Maybe I'll do a presentation on that soon. Now, what I was talking about earlier when I kind of briefly just skimmed right over it was this idea of specialization cycles. Now a specialization cycle is when I look at a client, a bodybuilder, myself, whoever it may be, and I say, wow, this individual has a dominant chest, humongous chest. However, their lats are very, very small. So in a specialization cycle, what I would do is I would take chest, which is already a dominant body part, shift it to the back burner, and what do I bring to the front burner? The weak body part, the lats. So before I was training everything twice a week, maybe I was on a push-pull legs training program where everything was getting hit twice a week, 
that's an evidence-based decision. Maybe in a specialization cycle, I take chest and I move it down to once a week and I move back up to three times a week. So now I've gone from chest doing maybe, we'll say, throw out a random number, 18 sets a week of chest, split over two sessions. Now I'm only doing one session, nine sets a week, just on maintenance mode, and I take those other nine sets from chest and I move them over to back to bump up my back volume and my back frequency throughout the week. So a specialization cycle is a good time to periodize in some additional frequency that may lead to additional hypertrophic benefits. Again, try it out. And try it out is kind of my take home point from this entire thing. I wanted to dive into the research and I wanted to be like, boom, here you go suckas, six times a week frequency, that's the way to do it. Four times a week, that shit's on twice a week. Um, but I didn't find that. I didn't find it at all. I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. It's not out there. Um, so we have to take what we've got in the research. And that says that twice, maybe three times a week is better than once a week. But anything above that, we're not so sure. And when we're not so sure about something, what are my recommendations always? Squat Dad will tell you to try it out yourself. So try it out. Try out some of these specialization cycles. Try training back four times a week. Can you recover? Can you get quality sessions in? Let's say you're like, all right, I'm going at this back training hard. I'm gonna do six sessions a week. And you wake up after week one and you're just like absolutely crippled. Like, oh God, I can't go to the gym today. Too much. You, I mean, quite simply put, you did too much. Dial it down. So there's gonna be some feeling out, some trial and error here. Build up slowly. If you usually train back twice a week and you wanna increase the size of your back, train it three times a week. Eh, feeling good, feeling better. I can recover, I can still train. Try four times a week. Still recover, still train. Got to, it's getting a little, getting a little bit harder. Maybe that's your limit right there. It's four times a week. But this is something that you're going to have to try out for yourself. Uh, remember that getting it wrong is the quickest way to know how to get it right. Is that some wisdom right there? That might be some wisdom right there. Take that with you. Write it on a uh, post-it note on your desk. Put it on your refrigerator. Squat dad. Got to do it right to make sure that you got to do it. See, I don't even remember my own wisdom. Got to do it wrong so that you can get it right. All right, now we're at the end and I'm officially babbling. So those are my take home points there. Um, stick to the principles as well. Stick to your principles of specificity, overload, fatigue management, all that good stuff. So still follow the rules, but kind of bend them a little bit and see if you can find uh, the right frequency that allows you to bring up those lagging body parts. As always, thank you for tuning in. Leave a like, leave a comment, leave a subscription. Hit the subscription bell thing to let you know when Gifted Performance drops another video fresh out of the render oven. As always, go over and sign up for the website. It is $30 a month. You get 15 programs written by yours truly that will take you to your results. They have led people to bodybuilding competitions, to powerlifting meets. There are also some Olympic weightlifting programs and some general fitness programs on there as well um, when you sign up when you create that free account you can always click on that custom training tab to sign up with one of our great coaches we've got myself Ryan Zeisloff I work with general fitness bodybuilding weightlifting powerlifting I work with all of them we've got Paul Serafini great working with bodybuilders uh, both enhanced and natural also works with general fitness individuals and powerlifters. Thomas Neal is our powerlifting savant. We throw all of our powerlifters to him. He's coached some top 10 all-time powerlifting totals. We've got Hector Paez, who is our biotechnology, bio, I don't even know what he is anymore, specialist. Um, his Instagram is at mTOR. Hit him up if you have any questions. He works with general fitness individuals as well as bodybuilders. And last but not least, we've got our return to play specialist, Mike Taylor, Dr. Mike Taylor, sorry, for all of your injury needs. Um, hit that man up and he will get you fixed up and back to your best. I got this light on my head. Um, with that said, I am out. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram. We are at Gifted Performance. Ask your questions, hit our DMs. Let us know what you want to see answered next. I will see you on the next one. Stay gifted, my friends.